G'day guys, Story Hawk here. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Thanks for stopping by and uh, enjoy the video. Coworker tried to get me fired over breast implants, so I pulled a reverse UNO card. Four years ago now, when I was 24, my mum died of breast cancer, and as both my grandmothers had also died of it, I saw a specialist for a screening. I found out I had some cells in one of my breasts that could have turned cancerous at any given moment. I was told I had a few options. One, I could have regular screenings every three or four months until it does develop into cancer. I was told the risk of the cells becoming cancerous was very high due to family history, but I could also potentially never could turn, so I'd just be getting these screenings for no reason. Two, I could get a single mastectomy on the breast with the bad cells, but they'd need to keep an eye on the other one, so I'd still need regular checkups for the other breast. Three, I could get a bilateral mastectomy and remove all of my breast tissue, basically eliminating the risk. I went for the bilateral mastectomy. It was admittedly the most drastic option, but after seeing what cancer did to my mum and grandmothers, I didn't want to risk it. I was warned about scarring, but told it should be very minor. It wasn't, and I was left with two huge pink jagged scars on either side of my chest, each about an inch long and half an inch wide, and it caused me to go into severe depression, where it got to the stage of me not even leaving my flat because I didn't want people to see me throwing out my mirrors and getting physically sick looking at myself. I went to a therapist who suggested a plastic surgeon. The therapist said they'd never normally do that, but it was clearly something I was struggling with and I might never get over it, and the therapist could see why I struggle with it, although I'll admit the therapist did send me to ask about scar reduction. The plastic surgeon suggested a cream, a laser or implants. The cream didn't work and the laser was both expensive and risky, so I went with the implants. My natural boobs were an F cup, so I went with a slightly smaller double D. Since then my mental health has improved and I feel a lot better about the way I look. My confidence has gone up, as has my self esteem. I know I shouldn't put so much into my appearance, but I wasn't exaggerating about these scars. Huge, bright pink, jagged, raised, just really awful to look at and I hated seeing myself. And they are now nicely hidden away and you can barely feel them. In the present day, I'm 28 years old and working in an office. I'm doing a lot better than I was. My co-worker, Jill, found out I'd had a boob job, but not about the cancer thing. When myself and my friend from years before the mastectomy were planning a holiday and she made a joke about me going on a plane with my implants and Jill overheard. By the end of the day, the entire office knew I'd had a boob job, but not why, and half a dozen people confirmed Jill had told them. Over the next few months, Jill had made many jokes and comments about my chest to co-workers when I was in earshot, at one point saying I had more plastic than Barbie and calling me fake in two ways. I didn't hear this one myself, but a friend in the office told me that Jill had at one point referred to me as a sack of silicon. I don't know what her problem was exactly, but at one point she mentioned the NHS, so I assumed Jill thought that I'd got my chest done for free on taxpayer money. I'd gotten the mastectomy on NHS but gone private for therapy and implants. I asked her to stop more than once, but unfortunately the places that I'd talked to her were places like the lift and the woman's bathroom where there weren't many cameras, and Jill just kept making comments no matter how often I asked her not to. I wouldn't say it was every single day, but I heard at least three comments per week for three months. I hit my breaking point when me, Jill and a few other co-workers were having lunch. I referred to something as being shallow and Jill said you'd know all about being shallow while gesturing to my chest. I snapped. I said, do you know why I have these? A few years ago the doctors found potentially cancerous cells in my breast tissue. I was advised to get a mastectomy and was left with huge ugly scars on my chest. I went to see a therapist who sent me to a cosmetic surgeon who advised me to get implants to hide the scars. And I did, just so I could look at myself in the mirror without crying. So maybe next time you want to judge someone for having cosmetic surgery, you should ask them why they had it first. And feeling like that was a mic drop moment, I picked up my food and left. For the rest of the day, I had about one third of my office come up to me and offer support. And the rest tell me that Jill was just joking around and I was being dramatic. I replied that Jill was being dramatic long before I was. I then got an email from HR saying they wanted to talk to me the following day, and when I called for clarification they mentioned a hostile work environment. Note, this is apparently an American term and holds little weight in England, but it's what was said over the phone. I knew the person who'd signed off the email and I'd spoken to. 
Her name was Debbie, and she was Jill's friend in HR, so I was fairly confident in who had reported me. I realised that if this was already being sent to HR, I needed as much ammunition as possible, so I went about collecting my information. As Debbie had dealt with me so far, it was safe to assume she would be the person reviewing the complaint with me, and if that was true, I was freaked. However, I vaguely remembered a section on complaints that was in my contract when I first signed with the company. I flicked through the contract and there was a part and complaint section that said I was contractually allowed to request a change of reviewer if I felt my allocated reviewer was biased. It was called an impartial overseer. I photocopied the page and highlighted that part. Then I messaged the people who had offered their support over Facebook and said basically, HR have asked to see me, do any of you remember Jill insulting me to your face and are you willing to write and sign something saying what you heard and when? Not everyone was willing to help as Jill is somewhat feared in the office due to her befriending HR and management, but about 20 people were willing to help me. I guessed roughly when I'd asked Jill to stop previously. The four asks over the last few months, some timings were easy to guess that they'd happened on my break or when I first arrived at work, and I wrote them all down, along with a rough time of when the lunchroom confrontation happened and a list of names of who was there for the lunchroom confrontation. I got to work slightly early in the next morning. I went round everyone who had messaged me and most of them managed to give me a printed and signed letter. Some didn't manage to write one, but no big deal. This isn't exact words as there's 16 letters to sum up here, but the gist was, my name is, their name, I worked with Jill last name and OP, on date, at, time, approx, I spoke with Jill last name, during which she referred to OP as quoted insult. I felt this was inappropriate as it directly related to OP's appearance and am willing to go on record further to establish that Jill, last name, has been discussing OP in the workplace in some manner for three months now, causing me discomfort and creating what I feel is a hostile work environment. Signed, their name. I wound up with about 16 letters, all from different people, and one of them was in the lunchroom for my conversation with Jill. Some even had bullet-pointed lists of everything Jill had said to them about me or other people. As it turns out, Jill has issues with a lot of people's appearances. She apparently made comments about one co-worker's weight and something anti-Semitic about a different co-worker's nose, all of which were put in these letters. There are about 45 people in this office, so while 16 wasn't a majority, it's still a decent amount. The letters weren't hugely long, most were only a paragraph, but they all had the necessary information. I was asked to come to HR at 10am. I took the letters from co-workers, the photocopy of the page and my contract, and my dates and times in a little folder with me. I got there and Debbie was the one overseeing the interview. She got up from her desk, ready to lead me into another room. I immediately turned to the other HR worker that was currently there and said, So is my meeting with you then? Debbie said, No, you're with me. I replied that this wouldn't sit well with me as my contract states I have a right to an impartial overseer and as I said this I took the contract page out of my folder. Debbie read it. I wouldn't let her take the paper when there was a shredder so close by and said she could be impartial. I replied that I really didn't mean to be a pain but I had it on good authority that the person on the other end of this complaint is her friend and my contract does say I'm allowed an impartial overseer. Debbie stomped off to get supervisor. Supervisor asks how I know she can't be impartial, and I tell him that I have it on good authority that the Jill, who was on the other end of this complaint, is a close friend of Debbie. He asked Debbie if this was true, to which she only replied, I can be impartial. Supervisor took a deep breath, asked the other HR rep to come with him, and the four of us all went to review the complaint. I thanked them for being so accommodating. I was worried I'd annoyed them. Debbie took out the complaint and all three of them went through it with me. Debbie looked homicidal the whole time the interview was happening, as she had clearly anticipated firing me, or at least recommending me being fired. The interview went something like this. It took like over half an hour and they kept asking me the same questions but phrased different ways, so this is a really drastically condensed version. Question. You said outside that you think Jill last name reported you. Why is this? Answer. Jill has had an issue with me for about three months now. Question. Why didn't you come to us when you realised Jill had an issue? Answer. I had no issue with her. 
what issues does Jill have with you? Four years ago, a specialist identified potentially cancerous cells in my breast tissue. I had surgery to remove my breast tissue, thereby removing the cells and the risk. After the surgery, I was left with large scars on my chest. I went to a therapist for low self-esteem and depression. The therapist suggested a plastic surgeon who suggested breast implants to cover my scars. All of this is in my medical history, which you have a copy of in my file and my full permission to review. Jill found out about my breast implants, but didn't know about the cancer. Jill had a problem with my breast implants and decided to communicate this problem to her co-workers. Why do you feel this is true? Well, here's 16 signed statements, all from different co-workers, all testifying that Jill told the entire office I'd had breast implants on the day she found out and has since made comments about these implants frequently. They have quotes of what Jill said to them about it and rough dates and times. Rough dates and times? No one knew this would be escalated to such an extent, so no one really took notes as to when it happened. What event or events do you think directly led to this complaint of harassment? Well, for me, harassment began when Jill told everyone about my breast implants without my consent. But as to the complaint placed against me, it would probably be what happened at about time yesterday in the lunchroom. Jill made a comment about me being shallow while gesturing to my breasts, and I replied by giving her an abridged version of my relevant medical history and ending with a comment about the importance of getting the full story. There are cameras in the lunchroom, so I'm sure you'll be able to find that conversation. I'll admit I could have handled the situation better, but after three months I felt I had to put my foot down. Here's a list of names of people who were also present. There were six people at the table, including myself and Jill. One of these people is also in those letters, and has written their account of the conversation and signed it. Had you had a conversation with Jill prior to this regarding her comments about you? Several spaced out over the last three months. Each time I communicated to her that I felt uncomfortable and upset with these comments she was making and would appreciate it if she were to stop. To your knowledge, was Jill made aware of your former cancer at any point in this time? No. It wasn't mentioned in the conversation with my friend she overheard and I didn't tell her because frankly it's none of her business and I did not feel the need to detail my medical history to a co-worker in order to avoid further sexual harassment. Supervisor stands up and says, well I think we're done here. He shakes my hand and sends me back to my desk saying that I'd hear from them after they reviewed the evidence, letters, CCTV, medical history and anything they had already, and made a decision on the case. I got back to my desk, pulled up my CV and prepared to start the job search again. About an hour goes by, then the person who wrote the letter and was there for the lunchroom conversation gets called for a meeting with HR. They come back 10-ish minutes later. The other people who were also there for the lunchroom conversation get called one by one, except Jill. All of them are gone for about 10 minutes, then come back, find a co-worker and say that HR wants to see them. Then the people who wrote the letters but weren't there yesterday are also called one by one and are each gone for about 10 minutes each, some longer, some shorter. By about 3.30, it looks like everyone who wrote a letter or was there in the lunchroom has been interviewed. Then, finally, Jill gets called in. She's gone for about 30 minutes and comes back fuming. She glares at me while I work, but I ignore her. 4.30ish, Jill gets called into HR again. 5 p.m. rolls around. Everyone is either leaving or getting ready to leave. And when Jill storms back into the office, she glares at me the whole time she packs up her desk. She then starts telling anyone who will listen that I got her fired before shoving her way onto the lift. An email comes in from HR. My case is closed. My hag of a stepmom gave away my PlayStation 4 while I was away in college. So I rent out her house while she was on her honeymoon with her newest husband. I've been reading lots of Reddit lately, especially entitled parents, but made a new account when I came across this page. I never thought I'd actually try to contribute something. Until now, Reddit has just been my guilty morning coffee read. So here goes. I'm an only son. My mum died of ovarian cancer at only 55, five years ago. It broke my dad's heart. They had been together since college and were the same age, with my dad being a month older. I'm 22, and I'm about to graduate college with my degree in chemistry when the main events start to occur. 
I went to college on a full ride scholarship. This is important later. My dad met my now stepmom when she was my mum's nurse at the hospital where she spent her final days. My stepmom, Grace, played all the right notes to gain my dad's trust. She was empathetic to him, nurturing, comforting after my mum passed. I was 17 and old enough to sense that she was just trying to weasel her way into getting my dad's resources, but it was up to my dad if he wanted to be in a relationship with her. I was in my final year of public school and had just won a scholarship to attend college out of the country of the following year. My dad mourned my mum for a year, and that whole time Grace would check in on him by phone every month or so, in my opinion to scope out the possibility of sinking her hooks into him. After a year passed, Grace took the gloves off and went hard after my dad. Grace was only 40 when she and my dad started seeing each other. I didn't like her, but at the same time my dad at least didn't seem depressed anymore. So I tried to be less pessimistic about her and give her the benefit of the doubt. In my gut, I didn't trust her though. But we are Scandinavian, and at least in my family, the son does not tell his father what to do or even offer any opinion. Grace is from the Czech Republic, if you're wondering. My father was a very successful banker during his career and amassed quite a portfolio of wealth. I'll spare you the details, but after six months of dating, Grace and my father are married. My dad never really got over my mum though, and he was getting weaker and weaker even though he was only 57. Since his health was fading, he called me to him and asked me point blank, Boy, what do you need to set you up in this life? I told him I don't need anything. I'm a man and can take care of myself. But what are you even talking about, Dad? You're going to be around for decades yet. I did remind him that he had living sisters with children, my aunts and cousins. I also reminded him that I had a full scholarship to college, so don't worry about giving me any cash. He was dead only a year later, at 59. I, of course, have seen lots of Hollywood movies, so I consider the conspiracy theory that maybe my dad's nurse wife poisoned him and made him sign over all his money to her, but I really honestly do not think that's what happened. Other relatives didn't like Grace either, but they knew my dad was totally in love with my mum and that her death utterly broke him. Well, long story short, my dad bequeathed his five bedroom house to me, even though I wasn't expecting it and didn't ask for it. He gave a small endowment to each of his sisters and their children. He left about 80% of all his existing money to Grace, which amounted to several hundreds of thousands of dollars. My dad ignored me because he's generous to a fault and still gave me several tens of thousands of dollars, which were of course very useful to me. Grace tried to put on a friendly front, but I could tell she was angry as heck that she didn't get my dad's house too. That belonged to me, and I had the legal papers to prove it. She was especially mad because we live in an extremely upscale and trendy location, and houses are hard to come by, and are easily sold for massive profit. During the first few months after my dad's death, I had the nauseating, creepy experience of knowing that Grace was trying to feel me out to see if I might be into a little relationship with her. Um, gross. She still stayed at the house though because over the last three years she had gotten used to living there and acting like she owned it. And even though I officially owned it, I was always away at college and only visited my dad's old house once every couple of months. And even then it wasn't to see Grace, but to see my cousins who lived just a few miles away. I downplayed the fact that it was really my house. And over the months I think Grace gradually forgot that she really had no legal right to the house. She probably believed that sooner or later, because I never asked her for any of the hundreds of thousands of my dad's dollars that she now had, that I was somehow independently wealthy and would just give up my house to her. I knew I'd eventually hydrogen bomb this woman when she started dating some new guy only five months after my dad was in the ground, and one time when I came home from college after graduating, she and her new boyfriend, some sleazy looking d-bag named Ivan, who was only a few years older than me, were acting like I was a guest in my own house and that they owned it. I played along. Grace told me she gave away my PlayStation 4 to Ivan's cousin because I'm too old to play with video games. I don't even know this guy and you give him my PS4 to give away to some other guy who I also don't know? I quickly changed all my network passwords that same day. I smiled but I knew what I had to do eventually. She also said that she and Ivan were getting married because I just can't mourn your father forever. I have to move on in life. I told her that I graduated college and already secured employment with a local firm, 
and will soon find a new place to live. She looks thrilled, especially the part where it looks like I'll soon have a new place to live. Then, in a patronising way, she tells me, You always have a place in our house, though. You're welcome to stay whenever you please. Thanks, Grace. Really generous of you. What I really say is that I will probably have a new place in three months. She says that it's wonderful because she intends to go to her homeland to have a wedding with Ivan and afterward have her honeymoon. She assures me it's a local affair, otherwise I'd invite you honey, and anyway I know you're so busy. I congratulate her. She asks me if I can watch the house for her. Watch my own house? Sure. What I really say is of course I will take care of the house. I am careful to not say, your house. She and her D-bag fiancé, who I am 100% sure is only there for Grace's money, go on their trip and I immediately put out advertisement in rental websites offering to lease my house. I hire movers and have all of Grace's furniture and possessions boxed up and put in a storage rental facility. I retain all of my parents' furniture that they had before my dad met Grace. Locks? Changed. All of them. Within days, I am inundated with dozens of inquiries regarding my amazing furnished house with fantastic views. I rent it to a wonderful young family, a barrister and his schoolteacher wife, and their two preteen children. They pay me their first and last month's rent, and sign a lease for the year. I warn them about my crazy stepmom who thinks this is her house, but I present them with contact information to my lawyer, the same lawyer my dad retained, in case they need any assurance that I'm on the level. I also give my lawyer the information about the storage facility, including the fact that I generously paid four months of storage in advance, which is a whole month longer than Grace's Czech honeymoon adventure. I then found a great apartment in the city near my place of work. There I met a woman in a restaurant I frequent at night after a long work day. We've been dating six months now and are engaged to be married. Grace of course tried to shriek and cause trouble when she realised she got kicked out of my house but my lawyer quickly shut her mouth without my having to ever speak to her garbage face again. From what I hear, her and her trash husband left the country and I assume they're blowing through my dad's money and will soon be broke like chavs usually become when they taste a little bit of what they think is the good life. So maybe Grace will go and try to exploit some other lonely man into giving her his money. Speaking of money, the house that I rent out is generating so much money that I not only am able to help pay for my cousin's college, but I moved into a larger apartment of my own, together with my fiancé. I love my job, but really, I could survive solely on renting my dad's old house. And to think, if Grace had only been cooler and nicer, I might have let her stay at the house, just to be a good sport. And definitely if she stayed the heck out of my room. But no, she had to act all proprietary. So I had to make her homeless as a wedding gift. Postscript. I bought another PS4, even though I didn't even use my old one that much. It didn't matter. It wasn't for Grace to give away. You don't give away other people's things. You give away your own things. Which is why I chose to kick Grace out of my house. Because it's mine. And I decide who stays there. Thanks so much guys for sticking around to the end. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one.